Hello and welcome back to the Sea Scent Journey with me, Ryan. In this next section, we're going to start with infrastructure services. That's part four of the Sea Scent or ICND one. And we're going to first of all tackle DHCP, the Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. For those who don't know, you can contact me here on YouTube, on LinkedIn, or Twitter. Okay, so let's jump into it and have a discussion around DHCP and a big overview of how it works and of course why we need it as engineers. Once we understand everything we need to know from a high level point of view from DHCP, we can jump into Packet Tracer and start configuring DHCP. So first of all, it's called the Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. So it's an acronym you obviously need to remember there and it hands out network information to clients automatically. So far, we've talked a lot about LAN, switching, routing, and networking fundamentals, but we haven't talked about what actually happens when someone comes along and plugs something into our switch. How does this PC know that it should be 192.168.02? And how does this PC know it should be 192.168.01? And that they're both in a slash 24 subnet mask, and that they're default gateway in order to get to, let's say, Google or, or another application off the local network, their default gateway is 192.168.0.250. And this is all given to them normally in a production network by something called DHCP, again, the Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. And this sits on the network, sometimes depending on the organization, it can be the router, which is the default gateway, or they sometimes have dedicated servers at site, or a remote dedicated server for DHCP relay. Well, DHCP gives the ability where if a host who has no IP address connects to the network, it can't communicate with anyone because it doesn't have any IPs. So it goes through what we call the door process, which is the discover, offer, request, and acknowledge. And going through this process with a DHCP server, it's able to discover the server, even though the client doesn't yet have an IP, by using ports. And we'll go into how the server and client listens on the particular ports. Once discovered, the DHCP server will send a offer to use a particular IP address. And then that client will then request that IP address that was originally offered. It then of course acknowledges that that IP is being used by that client. Because a DHCP server is ultimately a list of all the IP addresses that are currently available in the network and which IPs have been taken and which IPs are free to be given to clients as they connect to the network. DHCP is of course very popular and used in most networks. The only alternative to DHCP is of course statically setting each IP address. And obviously that's not going to be a viable option if you've got a large network. In fact, if you think about your home, you come home, you connect on your Wi-Fi and you instantly get internet connectivity because your home device does DHCP and it's able to give you an IP address. Now DHCP normally gives you what we call RFC 1918 addresses and this is private addresses remember we've talked about very extensively about private IP addresses and then of course as they leave the network providing that this is a public network it will require some sort of NAT network address translation which is another topic that we'll pick up after DHCP but for now of course to understand DHCP is a protocol that allows clients on the network to dynamically obtain their IP address. But you'll notice that what I've actually said here is network information. I've not specifically said IP addresses. And the reason for that is because at the CSENT, you need to know that it hands out IP addresses. But in reality, it does a lot more than that. If we have, let's say, our router as a DHCP server, it can do things like when a IP phone is plugged into the network and that phone has no knowledge of the phone number it should have the phone profile it should have so which uh, what happens if I speed dial number one or speed dial number two 
What's my extension? Can I make outbound phone calls? Who should I send my voicemails to? All of this information is normally downloaded from a server, but when the phone connects, it doesn't know where that server is. So DHCP helps us with that. We got things like proxies. If we connect a PC to the, to the actual network and we want to make sure that the PC can only visit certain websites, we may lock it down with a proxy, but how does that PC know where to get the proxy information? We can use DHCP for that. So there are a lot of extra features that DHCP uses, and these features are called options. But obviously at the CSET level, we just got to know the basics. We need to know in particular how to set up a pool. So we've got a slash 24, how many how can we set up that pool to make sure people that connect to the network can get the next available IPs? We need to make sure that we can know how to set up a default gateway. So if you're inside a network and you want to communicate with someone outside that particular network, you need to know who the default gateway is. Another thing we need to be able to configure as part of our DHCP alongside the pool and the default gateway is something called DNS, the domain name system. And this is something we've not gone over yet in the CSENT and it will be coming up in this section in later videos. But the DNS allows us to resolve domain names to IPs or particular URLs to IPs. So what do I mean by that? Well, when you go into your web browser and you type in www. let's say bbc.co.uk, then your PC needs to find out where the BBC actually is. And of course, it doesn't know what uh, BBC actually is because it talks in binary. So it needs to then find out what the IP address is for the BBC. Maybe it's this particular server up here. And the DNS records are normally kept inside a server. That server can sometimes be local to you. Maybe your DHCP server is also your DNS server. Or maybe you use your ISP your service provider as a DNS resolver. But either way, when your IP's subnet mask default gateway are handed out to your clients, you normally give them the DNS servers too. And essentially, it's the location of the server that they can query to find out and resolve URLs or domain names back to IP addresses to finally reach the destinations. So it can route to that IP address. So I think we're going to a bit more uh, in later videos, but for now, DNS, very high level, it just resolves names to IPs. So again, DHCP comes in three flavors. Um, we can do DHCP relay, so our router can actually, re um, sorry, DHCP server, our routers can actually give out IP addresses to people on the network. We can become clients, which means that our router can obtain an IP address from another router, or it can obtain an IP address from a DHCP server. So we become a client instead of a server. The server hands them out, the client accepts them. Now what about our relays? Our relays work a little bit different. Normally what happens is a relay is where the DHCP server is outside the broadcast domain that we're living on. So our PCs down here, our PC is inside this broadcast domain because remember, routers break the broadcast domain. So when this PC down here, who doesn't have an IP address, sends out a broadcast packet trying to find a server to give it an IP address, it's not going to get a response because when this router gets that broadcast, it's not going to forward it on to the actual remote location. Because remember, when we need to go between broadcast networks or between network segments or however you want to say it, we need to route the traffic. So what we do is we can relay that broadcast traffic across the network. And we do that by having a device, in this case, this router set up is a relay agent. So what we do is on this router here, we tell it to listen for these broadcast messages and it will be broadcast into a particular port, which is 67 UDP that the DHCP service listen on. And when this router hears that broadcast message, it then routes it 
across this network as a unicast packet to the DHCP server, gets an IP on its behalf, brings it back across the network, and then gives it to the actual client itself. It responds to that initial broadcast as if the server was actually locally on that broadcast domain. So it simply just relays that broadcast message. Now how it works is a bit more complicated. How to set it up is one simple command. That's also another thing that will go and set up in Packet Tracer. It uses Dora. So something again I've talked about a few times is the discover, offer, request, acknowledge. So just go through a quick scenario. The discover is sent from the client as soon as it connects to the network. This is a broadcast packet, so it's sent to everyone inside the broadcast domain, and everyone will receive it on their NIC card and process it accordingly. However, only the server that's listening on the UDP port will actually continue to process it and send a response. Everyone else, once they decapsulate it, and they're not listening on those ports, so they have no application wanting that door, that DHCP discover, it will actually just drop it. Once the server gets it, it will send back the offer. It will say, allow me to offer you an IP address. But because the client don't have an IP at this point, it needs to also go to everyone. So that offer will go to all the clients inside the broadcast domain and again everyone will drop it because it's not looking for the response of the discover message. However this person here it will look in the DHCP header and it will see its MAC address which is known in the DHCP header as a client identifier and of course it be listening on the ports that DHCP is running and therefore it will continue to process that packet. It will then send back a request. This will also be a broadcast message because even though it's a request for a particular IP for the client, the server has not yet acknowledged that that client has accepted that IP. So the request will go back and again that will go to everyone on the network and people will drop it other than the server. The server will finally then do the last part of the process, which is to send an ACK back saying that you can now use this IP. I've acknowledged that you're going to use it. And therefore, if another client were to request an IP address, I will ensure that that IP is not given to them. Something that will be worth your time would be going over to uh, packetlife.net. And on Packet Life, they have a bunch of captures. And particularly in those captures, they have some for DHCP. If you scroll down and look for the DHCP.cap, click on the cloud chart, and it will actually show you a few packets that uh, DHCP sends out on the wire through this door process, the discover, offer, request, and act. You can see by opening up each individual packet, the contents of the DHCP, what's sent, received, and what happens to the IP addressing. So very key point is to notice the source and destination, that there's a lot of broadcast traffic in order to ensure that the allocation has been given to the client. And then you can also see once the door has finished, they then exchange a bunch of information for the additional options. So this would give you some visual representation of what's happening with the IPs, what's happening with the UDP port numbers, and what are the contents of the DHCP door process. So I think that I'd highly recommend just spending a good 10 minutes having a look at this, because the better you understand what's happening, the more clear DHCP becomes as a protocol, and things like DHCP relay makes much more sense. So again, to access that, simply just go over to packetlife.net, click on captures, and have a look at the capture for DHCP. There are also a bunch of cheat sheets on here, and these are very useful. 
So for example, the one for VLANs, very, very useful indeed. Some of the stuff we've already talked about, we've got what the frame looks like, how to create access and trunk ports, the different types of VTP that we've talked about, different types of switch modes, bunch of very rich information put onto a nice format that you can print out and pop on a wall somewhere. So it uses UDP port 67 and 68. So 67 is the ports that the servers listen on and 68 would be will be where the client listens. So any traffic going to the server will have the destination port of 67, source of 68, and any traffic going from the server back to the client will obviously have that in the reverse direction. So that's all we've got time for in this lesson. Just to go over what we've done, we first talked about DHCP as a whole. We said DHCP stood for the Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, and it allowed our host on the network to connect and obtain their IP information automatically. Normally, a DHCP server gives out basic information like an IP address, a subnet mask, a default gateway to get off the network, and DNS. But we know that DHCP can do a lot more than that. We talked about the additional options to enable things like IP phones to download their configuration. DHCP comes in different flavors. We have server, client, and relay. And these can all be configured on our Cisco routers. We said a server is where it will actually keep track of which IPs are given out to which host and will listen on particular ports for discover messages in order to lease IPs to individual hosts on the network. Clients are where we are actually requesting from a server. So we can have our routers set up so it can request an IP from a server, which can be a dedicated server or another Cisco box. And a relay. Remember when we talked about DHCP and we looked at the door process in a bit more detail and then that packet capture, we noticed there was a lot of broadcast traffic which meant that the DHCP server had to be inside the broadcast domain. If you had a WAN network, let's say an MPLS, and that MPLS had a bunch of remote sites, each remote site is gonna have its own router and its own IP range. Well, sometimes it's not viable to have a DHCP server at every site. So what they do is they end up having a central server and that central server has a DHCP server and each router is set up to relay to that central server. That's something we can do because we noticed that, like I said, there's a lot of broadcast traffic through the door process for DHCP and if your DHCP server is off the broadcast domain, then of course you need some sort of method to route it across there. Mm -hmm. So we'll go into DHCP relay in a bit more detail when we get to the configuration section of DHCP. We then talked about DOOR in general again, really important that you know what DOOR stands for and that you look at that packet capture on Packet Life to get a good view of what's happening on a uh, different steps of the DOOR process. And then lastly, ports. Remember that it's 67 and 68 that are used for the DHCP process. Make sure you know that 67 is the servers and 68 is the client. I hope this video has been informative. I'd like to thank you for viewing. And if it has been, please do like and subscribe.